Hello everyone and welcome back if you have joined our previous sessions and welcome if this is the first time you're joining. Um, I'm joined here with Lucy from Full Story who is going to be leading our next session. So without further ado, over to you Lucy. Thanks Ruth. I'm really excited to be here today with y'all. Um, again, I'm your presenter today, Lucy Huang, and thanks for spending the next half hour with me. Um, a quick primer on who you're about to listen to. Um, I'm a product manager at Full Story, your go-to spot for understanding your digital experience. Um, on a personal note, though, my career has been focused a lot on health and safety, privacy, integrity, risk, uh, you name it. Basically, I spend a lot of the time, I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about all the things that could go wrong, prioritizing what to work on first, and shaping the policies and procedures within organizations to manage that risk. I'm also based in San Francisco, and I've recently adopted a cat who I had to lock out of this room. So um, yeah, just a little bit about me. And then, yeah, here's a primer of what we're going to cover today, managing risks in AI technologies. So here, just we'll know that all opinions are my own, except when I pulled in some headlines to highlight what's going on in the industry. It's a very fast um, changing place. And if you've probably noticed recently, it's probably hard not to notice all the tremendous advances in AI, especially machine learning's generative models. So today we'll talk about those advances in machine learning and what AI governance frameworks you can apply to manage your risk, those private uh, user privacy and ethics. So to kick it off, here are two anti-goals that I don't want you to come away with from this call. Um, number one, I'm not here to fear monger, but that doesn't mean that there's a very real risk that we are responsible for as shapers of product and messaging this to the market and our customers. Secondly, I'm not a machine learning engineer or a lawyer, but I am here to talk about the risks of AI. And that should show that even you can start to contribute to your organization's policy and procedures governing AI. So yeah, we'll get into it. We'll start with a little bit of history. Um, in 2022, we actually saw a really tremendous advance or spurt in those generative models. And along with that, there was surprisingly open distribution and access. As a high level primer on generative models, um, these are different from discriminative models that were more widely used um, in previous aspects of data science. So discriminative models, they're these class of um, supervised machine learning models that make predictions by estimating conditional probability. We won't get into the math of it too much, but um, TLDR, they can't generate new samples. It's more of a if this, then that logic um, used for classification tasks where we might use X features to classify to a particular class Y. Um, one example is email spam. That might be a simple yes or no label for this email inspector that you're building. Um, then now we've moved on to the era of more generative models, which are a class of algorithms that make predictions by modeling out joint distributions. There are a lot more steps involved here to take the probability of the class and the estimated distributions. But again, the TLDR, they take input training samples and learn a model that represents that distribution. So again, taking that email spam example, generative models can actually be used over time to generate emails that could even feel, uh, fool the email inspector. So the twist is that over the time, uh, the generative model could gradually fool a discriminator or that um, email yes or no spam inspector we've talked about. And that's what we're seeing today in more recent advancements. If you take um, that specific flavor of generative models, um, we have uh, large language models or LLMs that use deep learning and neural networks. Uh, such as like ChatGPT. Um, we also have uh, text to image models such as like Dolly that incorporate computer vision and natural processing. We've even seen text to video um, projects come out from Meta, which takes it a little bit further than text to image. Um, there's a lot of, I think, really interesting technologies that I would urge you to try out here. And then uh, now we'll kind of go into one of the initial risks one thing you'll notice with this presentation is probably that I don't have a lot of images, and that's because one of the risks I'm going to talk about is copyright. So earlier I mentioned that the distribution of these technologies was surprisingly open. We'll take the analogy of cars, first of all, because I'm assuming that everyone has driven or ridden at a car at some point in their life. To take that car analogy further, um, everyone has to get a driver's license to make sure that you're qualified to drive. You have to understand the policies and procedures of the road. 
there are also different types of licenses to show that you have knowledge of the specific vehicle. In addition, we have seat belts and speed limits to protect yourself and others from harm. There's also signage on the road, so that provides notice and transparency. And with the democratization of generative AI, we're actually giving these cars to a wider audience than ever before, but here the driver's test is optional. For example, ChatGPT. How many folks have tested out the open beta there? Um, if you're familiar with Midjourney, another text-to-image service, they're actually available via a Discord server bot that has millions of users. And personally, I'm all for the wider spread use of AI and access by different audiences, but we need to recognize that there are guidelines required. Where are the seatbelts and speed limits? And who's volunteering to use them for generative AI? There aren't a clear set of guidelines for the purposes of generative AI today, how it should be used and how it can be measured. And honestly, this isn't much of a surprise given that the US is already one of the largest countries without significant federal data privacy laws. Um, to take it back a little bit, um, most organizations actually found that the onset of GDPR actually helped them build a clear, more distinct organization organized around managing uh, consumer transparency and privacy. And as frustrating as it is for us to probably see all those cookie banners today, we still raise the tide for all ships and humans on them with that set of standards. A Deloitte survey found that 40%, 44% of consumers felt that organizations cared more about their privacy after GDPR came into fruition. And even now, Europe is leading the way with the first proposed AI Act, which is the first set of um, regulatory frameworks uh, for AI governance. So yeah, I think today we're seeing that folks are being car being given cars without a seatbelt and being told to drive and explore generative AI. And with this great power comes great responsibility. And your organizations and you should include that within your AI and product strategy. Now we'll go into the copyright piece that I touched on a little bit earlier. So here we have a headline from the New York Times where an AI-generated picture won an art prize and artists aren't happy. So here, a digital artist actually entered into an art contest in Colorado in the digital arts category and won $300 first place, um, you know, some good uh, coffee money there. Um, they actually used Midjourney, which I talked about before. Um, it's a service that's available on a Discord service that provides um, text to image renderings. So here, the digital artists actually took these renderings from Midjourney um, and did make significant adjustments to these images in Photoshop until he is satisfied, enhanced the resolution of the images using a tool called Gigapixel, and ended up submitting these pieces on Canvas. Uh, they're now listed for sale at $750 a piece based on their assessment of fair market value. With all these advances in technology, the question comes up of what makes AI different from a camera that captures the presence of someone else's creation. And here, the answer is copyright. This is a significant headline for Reuters because it documents one of the first decisions by a US court or agency on the scope of copyright projections for AI created works. So um, here, an example is relating to the images in a graphic novel that were again used by that same AI system, the journey, um, the US Copyright Office actually ruled that this, uh, the images in this graphic novel should not have been granted copyright protection. Granted, the text that the author made is, but not the images. And though the author did mastermind the prompts for this text to image generation of the images, the author ultimately did not create these images. So how does this relate to you and your customers? Takeaway number one, your customers will be under scrutiny for using AI tools and services that you provide. So how can you protect your customers from that risk? Takeaway number two, you need to avoid the use of these protected data sets or find ways to partner on the royalties of them. Otherwise, your monetization strategies will be impacted. I suggest partnering directly with creators or the sources of these training data to ensure that your value chains are protected. And as a note, the space is constantly changing. Um, just last week, we had some notable names sign on an open letter that called for a six month ban on creating AI that's more powerful than GPT-4, which I believe is open to access as of today. So 
Is this open letter a ploy for certain founders of open AI to solidify their lead in the market? Eh, I'm not really here to comment on that. Really, my intentions are more to highlight the risks of AI on society as a whole and how this is also being recognized by leaders and the gap of what we're actually seeing of action to address that. So this open letter says that AI systems such as GPT-4 are now becoming human competitive at general tasks. And there are these risks for such systems that could be used to generate misinformation on the massive scale, as well as the socioeconomic impacts of potential mass automation of jobs. Again, it's not my intention to fear monger, but it is important to at least be aware of the risks, such as the prevalence of deep fakes and um, additional tools of generative AI. There's just more tools available for bad actors to use. So your trust, safety, integrity, um, all that specific flavor teams, they'll also need to up-level themselves to understand and combat malicious use of these tools. And if you're in this space already, you're pretty familiar with how quickly um, bad actors and fraud rings can level up. Um, they're really agile. So here are some examples of what to consider. In the risk and fraud space, take identity verification. For example, submitting driver's licenses or documents that are submitted. These could also be generated by AI or um, certain PAI pieces as well. Um, we also have social media. The prevalence of bots is already a huge issue. Imagine bots having access to these large language models that are able to replicate human speech and language and communication at a higher level than before. Um, extremist groups or other unsavory characters might take advantage of these tools to further their agenda on your community platforms. And then last example is financial services. Um, here we are able to think about maybe account takeovers or these scammers that are tricking unsuspecting folks to reveal information with really sophisticated pre-generated chat scripts. So now that we've covered how the unexpected uses of AI um, by bad actors might induce risk, we'll move on to risk management frameworks. How can we address these? And yeah, today we'll walk through the initial traditional um, risk management frameworks. And then next we'll talk about how this evolves with AI governance. So this is following guidance from the US Department of Commerce's um, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, these y'all are probably already familiar with kind of the essential activities to prepare your organization on how to manage security and privacy risks. Um, one, categorizing the system and information that's processed, where is it stored, how is it transmitted, running an impact analysis on that, um, selecting controls to actually protect your system based on that initial impact analysis, and implementing and documenting those controls. We'll also over time need to assess and audit if those controls are actually in place, if they're operating as intended and producing the desired results. Um, you also need senior officials to authorize um, the system to operate. And then and, uh, lastly, continuously monitor that control implementation and any additional risks that might come up for your system. For all this, you really need a higher level set of policies and procedures to guide your organizations where software can. Ideally, you have all three of those, though. To tie this to analytics and some of the AI talks later, I think really common themes that you can pull out here are that data classification piece and also establishing provenance of that data. This is where we'll go into a little bit more next. I'm going to take a break for water. So one thing I want to bring up is that there's not really any significant regulatory frameworks uh, regarding AI governance today. And it's more likely that the EU will get to this first, like they did with GDPR. In fact, I think the EU has already proposed the first set of regulatory frameworks called the AI Act. Um, look it up. I would really recommend reading it. Some recommendations around governmental action in that space are to establish new authorities or agencies that are capable of tracking and overseeing the development of advanced AI and also the large data centers that are used to train it. Um, there's also potential recommendations to watermark or establish the provenance of AI generated content. And then uh, lastly, um, liability, what happens uh, when AI harm is caused and additionally support to increase public, public funding for AI safety research. So 
Um, here, on a separate note from those recommendations in the AI Act, we'll actually get into the AI risk management framework. This is version one that's been shared by the same National Institute of Standards and Technology. Again, I would recommend keeping abreast of the space because it changes incredibly fast. Um, GPT-3 was a talk just a few months, and now GPT-4 will soon be available to um, users as well. Um, so yeah, again, this is just version one. The, really, the goal of this risk management framework um, published by um, the NIST is really to cultivate trust in AI technologies, which is necessary if society as a whole is to widely accept AI. The core of this framework really describes four specific functions. Um, in the center, you govern, map, measure, and manage around it. This is to help organizations address the risks of AI systems and practice, and we'll talk through each of these functions and how they're applied in context specific use cases and throughout stages of the AI lifecycle. I think at the center of this, again, is really building those initial policies, procedures, processes, govern. You want to make sure that a culture of risk management is cultivated and present within your organization. So ensure that they are able to uh, manage, understand, and document the regulatory requirements involving AI and being able to tie that to specific tactical policies, procedures, and steps within your organization, and taking that a step further, tying that to the actual product experience and product design. You also want to ensure that there are mechanisms in place to actually govern and inventory your AI systems. And as you're doing this, as you're building your AI governance team, make sure it's a diverse team with diverse skill sets, backgrounds, skills, et cetera. Um, I would recommend uh, maybe something you could start as soon as next week is to host uh, tabletop exercises. Encourage your teammates to try out ChatGPT, try out Dolly, and build a muscle for this type of thinking of how these types of tools might be used and how they might be governed. Uh, next, we have the map piece of this, which really ties things to context. Um, how do we recognize the context of what um, risks matter the most. For example, take ga gambling. In the entertainment industry, it's probably super okay to talk about gambling, uh, uh, propose um, products and features around it. But in other certain cases, um, gambling could be a more sensitive, not suited for work type of topic. So that context really, really matters. And by understanding that context, you can develop that intended purpose, benefits, norms in which AI can be deployed and documented. You also want, again, to, in this map function, define the specific methods used to implement the task that the AI system would actually support. Uh, and here, for example, you would want to at least um, outline, say, hey, this is using a classifier versus a generative model versus um, more of a recommender. Being able to define those specific methods is really important. As a part of map function, again, you'll also want to develop internal risk controls for the components of the AI system and keep abreast of any third-party AI technologies that might be used as well. Uh, lastly, for this map function, you also want to address the privacy and the provenance of the data used in this creation. For the manage portion of this framework, here this is where you can provide your PM mindset. Um, assess what risk is, exists, um, what to prioritize, and how to act based on that projected impact. Lastly, we have the measure portion of this, which is really talking about what are the ways that we can enumerate those approaches or metrics of the risks of adopting AI? You'll want to regularly assess the appropriateness and impacts on affected uh, user groups or communities. I would recommend pulling in domain experts and users to be consulted for their feedback. So hopefully this all resonates with you. It's not something that's too dissimilar, but um, here it's really important to outline those functions um, that we'll get into the next slide. So how will your actions translate? What are we protecting against? Um, one, we wanna provide respect for the original creators and artists. Um, given lack of copyright protections for AI generated works today, you wanna to make sure to protect, uh, to partner with those original creators to actually protect your value chain and your monetization strategies. Secondly, um, protection of privacy and ethics. Um, like what I mentioned in the previous slide, you want to carefully select the initial data used to train these models to avoid including toxic or biased content and make sure it's originating from a source that has given um, their consent towards their data being used in this way and uh, being provided proper notice and the abilities to pull out if needed. 
We also want to be careful about how AI tools might be used um, by bad actors, for example, as threats against democracy on like community platforms, um, used uh, in uh, financial services um, by scammers. So again, invest appropriately into your trust and safety teams. And you can start today um, by even just encouraging these teams to try prompt engineering themselves. It's really important to develop a familiarity with this technology. Um, lastly, it all comes down to reducing risk for our customers and society as a whole. So some strategies here are rather than employing an off-the-shelf generative AI model, you could consider building out smaller, more specialized models that are tuned to your needs of your organization. I would also recommend keeping a human in the loop to make sure that they're checking out the output of generative AI before it's actually published or used. And then lastly, to really make sure that you're able to responsibly use AI and also build familiarity with it, I'd recommend avoiding using generative AI models for critical decisions such as those involving significant resources or human welfare. While there's a need for us to be competitive and familiar with innovation in this space, we also have a responsibility to think about what impact this might have on certain communities and society. So here are the takeaways. And for all of these, you can start today. Timing is important, as we all know. So one, you want to prioritize trust because product management ultimately for AI is probabilistic and not deterministic. Here, as you've probably seen in a talk earlier today, trust is easy to lose and hard to gain. So it's important to prioritize consumer trust, transparency, and ethical principles when building these out. The reason this is important is because machine learning adds even more uncertainty. And the trade-off is that because of the scale that we're able to attain on machine learning, there's also going to be a small percentage of predictions that are going to be incorrect. And it's going to be really hard to understand why they're incorrect. It lacks explainability. This is because the ML code that has really seemingly uh, similar data sets of input output can give you wildly different results as an output sometimes. So this is really serious implications overall for the product development lifecycle and also for software development as well, such as like versioning, develop, uh, versioning and testing, because the data is never really as stable as we think. So as your product inevitably involves, your models that you've built will also start to drift and need to be monitored and managed. Again, tying it back to that risk management framework. Uh, lastly, uh, there also needs to be that foundational governance framework for your organization's teams to be able to take into practice. So at a high level, there needs to be partnership between community, legal, and policy teams to build this governance framework and review at least quarterly, then mapping that to the risk management framework that we discussed earlier in terms of map, manage, measure, assign your stakeholders, who's responsible for inputting these controls and monitoring that they're actually um, being implemented and producing the desired results. So I'm here basically today to chat about how we can all make an impact regardless if you're not a domain expert in ML. I think with the advent of chat GPT-4, we've really seen how it can become accessible to more folks. And because of that, everyone has a responsibility to weigh in and carry out this AI governance framework. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Lucy. So I think we have um, a few questions um, in chat. Um, Liza asked them earlier, but I think we may have covered it. Um, what are some of the unique risks associated with AI technologies that traditional frameworks may not adequately address? Um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything else in that, but we also have a few others. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could restate the question. I was looking through the chat, so my bad. Yeah, no worries. Um, what are some unique risks associated with AI technologies that traditional frameworks may not adequately address? Yeah, so I think it really goes into that monitoring portion that um, I mentioned towards the end, where with generative AI, those like input output pairs that you have initially, they can produce really different results um, as the outcomes. And it's really hard to understand why, because these models lack explainability. So because of that, you'll want to keep a human in the loop to actually review the results and monitor these results over time. Um, there's a concept called like model drift, where these inputs and outputs can change. 
as product managers, I think we're used to this problem in a different capacity where you ship something and you're saying, great, I'm going into maintenance mode and I'm going to listen to what customer feedback there is and make sure that um, everything's performing as expected. This works for more deterministic type of items where um, you always have a certain set of like outputs, but for um, these generative models, that is not always the case. So you'll need to keep a closer eye on monitoring that. Awesome, perfect. Um, thank you so much. Um, the next question, is there an example you can share of a specific AI-backed product that can be developed um, or, or augmented by walking through the NIST framework? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So let me think about this. Um, probably, you know, taking that like text to image example, because that's probably one, a lot of impact since so many different users just across the world have access to chat GPT um, or uh, Dolly, either of those types of generative models. So I think one really big question that comes up for me again, is that copyright. Um, we've already seen these rulings from the U.S. Copyright Office on AI-generated works not being protected, but at the same time, uh, companies like Midjourney are still providing services. Um, there's probably stuff that their teams are already working on to address these um, claims. How can they protect their value chains? Can they protect partner with creators to manage um, how that AI is being used and documenting that? But yeah, I would say that those specific examples are also dependent on your specific um, organization. Awesome, thank you. I've um, got another couple of questions in a couple more minutes. Um, so what steps can individuals take to understand the risks associated with AI technologies? Yeah, that's another really good question. I would say just start getting familiar with it, test out ChatGPT. I talk to ChatGPT every day. Um, and also be careful about what data you're inputting into chat GPT. For example, would you be comfortable with what you're copying and pasting to end up on like the headlines of a newspaper, for example? Um, I think that's where folks can start. Um, if you're not really familiar, I'd also recommend taking um, basic like Coursera courses if you wanna get a little bit more deeper into understanding more of the underlying technology. And then lastly, this is probably the hardest part is being an advocate for this the organization. Um, it's probably difficult to not feel like the only person that says no in the room or wanting to slow down the company when you see so many other, um, yeah, so many more of your industry peers wanting to move fast. But I think it's important because of the powerfulness of AI to understand what are the risks associated with it and um, showing that like you can have a voice too, even if you're not officially part of like your policy team. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we've got one more question to finish. Um, what are some of the ethical considerations that organizations must take into account when using AI? And how can they ensure that they are not um, inadvertently, per can't pronounce it, per <laughs> creating biases and discrimination? Yes, lots of good questions from this crowd. Um, honestly, we had more time just to talk in person on a panel or something about this, but um, there are certain frameworks that are published already by larger tech companies. Like, for example, Microsoft has an Office of Responsible Innovation that um, would be a good resource as well. As far as like, perpetuating those biases and discrimination, it really comes from one, building a diverse team of those backgrounds and making sure that your organization is supporting, putting resources, headcount, um, financial resources towards supporting um, those teams as well. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Um, and then someone has said, are there any particular Coursera? I can't, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, um, but I'm sure you know, um, know how to say, Lucy, um, courses that you'd recommend. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, for that one, I'd recommend anything by Andrew Ng. Um, I found his courses really helpful. Um, if you need it spelled, it's just Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W, last name N-G. 